Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 102, Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Francisa Vanini from the Orthopedico Rizzolo Institute at Bologna, Italy. Dr. Vanini was appointed as permanent resident of orthopedics at the Rizzoli Institute in 1998, following which she did a residency rotation at the foot and ankle surgery in the Union Memorial Hospital, Baltimore, United States. She completed her PhD in biotechnologies with respect to cartilage repair in 2006 at the University of Bologna. She was awarded the European Foot and Ankle Society Traveling Fellowship and the AOFAS Traveling Fellowship, along with the ICRS Fellowship. In 2004, she was appointed as a tutor in the Podiatry University of Bologna. In 2005, she was appointed as consultant at the Rizzoli Orthopedic Institute. And her main focus of interest is cartilage surgery with respect to the foot and ankle. She's part participated in several national and international research programs. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Francesa Vanini from the Rizzoli Orthopedic Institute, Bologna, Italy. Over to you, Francesa. Thank you. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to, host, to um, go with this webinar. And uh, this webinar will focus on the cartilage repair in the ankle. It's, uh, it's something that uh, is a topic that I'm uh, following up for uh, many, many years for basically all my careers. And uh, um, I think it's, uh, it's something very odd because uh, osteochondral lesion in uh, knee and ankle uh, are uh, something that's very much increasing due to the higher uh, diffusion of the um, sports practice. And, uh, and it's something that affects a younger population that uh, is uh, physically extremely demanding and need to go, to go on with their with their physical practice. And uh, uh, well, the, the battle against arthritis is, is a battle that is, that is a never ending. So uh, we're still fighting very, very hard to try to gain uh, uh, results, uh, the results in this, uh, in this field. And so um, basically when you have a large lesion uh, like an osteochondral lesion grade three, four, and uh, also failure of previous surgeries, uh, patient younger than uh, 50 years. So that's the moment when you really need to, uh, to uh, find uh, um, a procedure, a technique capable to really restore a cartilage of the most similar to the aligned cartilage as possible. And uh, uh, the goal is obviously to uh, both eliminate pain and, uh, and prevent arthritis. So uh, in 2005, we went to um, a classification of the, of the uh, osteochondral lesion of the talus, capable to give also uh, indications on what you should do in this lesion. So we went into uh, classifying the lesion into acute. And if you have an acute lesion, if the lesion is uh, smaller than one centimeter square or something that you think you are not able to fix, you just make a debridement. Instead, if the lesion is bigger, so more than one centimeter square and you can fix it possibly, you should, you should fix it. Uh, when we go into the chronic lesion, um, we classify uh, a type zero, which is this kind of lesion where the cartilage layer is intact. And uh, uh, if it is intact, uh, we, I don't think you should go into the stride to repair the supondral bone. And so uh, you should go for retrograde drilling and uh, we will see uh, some more techniques of rewards in capable to, um, uh, to augment this retrograde drilling and improve the repair of the, of the subchondral bone. Instead, uh, with the type one, uh, so less than 1.5 centimeters square, microfracture 
could still be an adequate, uh, an adequate technique. When you go into bigger lesion, uh, 1.5 centimeters square, and moreover, deeper lesion, lesion deeper than five millimeters, so you have to go into a cartilage repla replacement, a cartilage replacement procedure, and to take care also of the subchondral bone using like a bone substitute or, or a bone graft. If the lesion is very big, so a type three, then there is a, a massive anatomy destruction and uh, you should go for, for an allograft. And here we go. This is like a type one and uh, uh, this is the aspect you have uh, within the ankle and uh, um, you just, uh, just debrid it. When uh, the fragment is something you can fix, so uh, with a absorbable pin, you should arthroscopically or not try to fix the fragment back in place. And uh, um, this is uh, one image of that with the repair, the pre-op and uh, the follow-up two years post-op and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a nice repair of the cartilage. Uh, this is the point of the chronic type zero. So when the lesion is a, a lesion only of the subchondral bone without a clear damage of the, of the cartilage layer. And uh, uh, this is a point that uh, Nick Van Dyke explained very nicely. So um, like a small uh, fissure in the subchondral bone plate, uh, when the ankle is loaded, uh, permit the water within the, within the ankle to squeeze out of the cartilage into the subchondral bone and the diameter of the opening of the subchondral bone plate determine the pressure of the fluid flow. And this creates uh, uh, the cystic lesion within the, uh, the subchondral bone. And uh, th they may be very painful, but uh, in these cases, are we sure that the cartilage is sick? Well, uh, actually, in the majority of cases, uh, is, uh, is not. And so uh, this cartilage is often healthy and uh, uh, we should treat only the spondral bone. That's, uh, um, that's a theory that uh, uh, you can apply uh, to also other, other joints with the with good results and has been applied to other joints. So, to other joints. So, uh, this is the theory at the basis of the core, the compression in the hip, uh, where you go to target the bone marrow lesion and uh, um, improve the bone marrow lesion without uh, without damaging the the joint. And uh, also, this is at the base of the idea of the subchondroplastic. So the injection of uh, a different kind of bone substitutes for a mechanical support and either a biological support. And uh, uh, this process is capable to uh, facilitate the, the, bone, uh, the bone healing. And uh, um, we see when we go through the literature, we see that uh, uh, the core, the compression in the hip is something that really uh, improved uh, the, um, the hip uh, quality and uh, improved the, the duration of the hip life and was able to delay the uh, need of, uh, of a hip substitution. So why not? Uh, uh, try to use the same the same method for uh, for the ankle, and uh, uh, so in this case uh, we tried also to use the bone marrow aspirate uh, in order to to improve the subchondral bone, and this is the kit we used. You go uh, into the uh, posterior iliac crest where the uh, cells are. Um, in major number, and then you aspirate the bone marrow, you concentrate the bone marrow with uh, one device or, uh, or another. Now on the market, there are uh, definitely many. And arthroscopically, arthroscopically, you go and check uh, the quality of the, of the cartilage. And if the cartilage is okay, and you cannot see uh, an, actual, uh, an actual hole or damage, you uh, just go to target the lesion uh, under fluoroscopy and, uh, uh, and inject, uh, inject the, the bone marrow. 
uh, if you can, uh, if there is the chance, there is a true cystic lesion, we will see that uh, if there is a true cystic lesion, uh, you can also add some, some, some bone, some cancellous bone, as we will see. And here are a few cases, but in this case, you see there was a very big cystic lesion of the, of the medial malleolus. So we checked the um, internal part of the, of the ankle. We cleaned a little bit the, the cartilage, and then we went to a mini open on the malleolus in order to retrograde, the, the, in order to treat with a retrograde bone graft this, uh, this uh, lesion. And this is the pre-op and then the post-op. There is still some uh, um, bone marrow edema at uh, 72 months, but definitely the cystic lesion is, uh, is gone and the patient is, uh, is much better. And again, another, another case at two years follow-up treated with the, same, uh, with the same technique. The subchondroplastic instead does not use, uh, um, may not use uh, the um, cancellous bone and cells, but also can use uh, some kind of cement or uh, reabsorbable cement, like this kind of substitute. And uh, this has uh, uh, been used in the knee. And uh, also in the ankle, I'm trying for cystic lesion or uh, resistant uh, bone marrow edema to uh, go and put some cement uh, in order to, um, to improve the quality of the spondral bone. So a key point, uh, in my opinion, is that if the cartilage is intact and the disease is in subchondral bone, try to save the cartilage and address the subchondral bone alone. Uh, otherwise, when you have a bigger lesion, so a type 2 or a type 2A, uh, these two types uh, uh, are different because of the uh, depth of the, of the lesion. The type 2A is more than 5 millimeters. So um, in this case, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a long history of what we did in order to, uh, to repair this kind of lesions and uh, uh, how these methods we found improved over time with us. So uh, at the beginning, after just immediately after Lars Peterson proposed the cartilage repair with the autologous chondrocyte implantation, we applied this, uh, this technique into the ankle and uh, it was definitely a quite demanding procedure. We uh, went to uh, suture a periosteal flap uh, onto, onto the lesion. So it was an open procedure and uh, the chondrocyte were in liquid media injected under this, uh, this uh, periosteal flap. And uh, uh, we had a result up to 10 years uh, and uh, now more. And uh, uh, there were very big lesion. You can see the, the size of this lesion, very big lesion that really gained a good score and this scoring remained uh, stable over time. Here you see the cartilage, the quality of the repaired cartilage. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's quite a aligned cartilage with, uh, with the good safranino for the extracellular matrix. And then we also performed um, an MRI with the T2 mapping in order to uh, see if the quality of cartilage was similar to Yaline. And, and actually the uh, regenerated tissue had uh, um, a response very similar to, to the Yaline one. Ooh. Uh, then we had an evolution with the, um, with the use of um, a yellow graph C matrix capable to support the chondrocyte. So no more in liquid media, but in a 3D uh, feature. And this permitted to shift to a wall uh, arthroscopic, uh, arthroscopic procedure. And also uh, for this case, the scoring was very stable over time and uh, uh, permitted to extend also the indication. We treated also smaller lesion with that. 
and uh, um, you can see that the uh, scoring over time, the alpha score is, uh, is uh, still stable. And uh, we published the result uh, both uh, uh, on uh, the um, autologous chondrocyte implantation open and arthroscopically uh, in various, uh, various follow-up. And here again, we have a male, 32 years, uh, also for this case, a very big lesion, the collagen staining at 13 months for this, uh, this repair, and the MRI at uh, 36 months follow-up, again at five years, the T2 mapping showing a good cartilage regenerated. And of course, the autologous chondrocyte implantation had many advantages, uh, was capable to repair very big lesion with no donor site pathology and uh, uh, um, very good results stable over time. But uh, uh, it was obvious that uh, it needed two procedures for, um, for uh, the cellar vesting and the culture of the cells. And it was uh, uh, really uh, quite expensive. So uh, after that, we needed to shift uh, more than more or less for economical problems to, to a new trend. And uh, so we shifted to the use of bone marrow derived cells uh, that uh, um, could be able to substitute the chondrocytes. And the advantage of this, of this technique is that it is a one-step technique, so the cells can be processed directly on the, on the OR in the same time, so you just harvest the cell and load directly onto the scaffold. You see, uh, we used a uh, platelet gel, moreover, to uh, cover the, um, the lesion and provide some growth factors. And then we went to uh, the bone marrow harvesting and concentration directly in the OR. And the biomaterial was prepared, loading the cells uh, onto the membrane. And then it was arthroscopically implanted. Uh, let me see if I can show you the surgical technique, and there was a video. Um, the video is there, and maybe is going. So here we go. You can see uh, the lesion. Uh, the lesion is uh, prepared with uh, sharp margins, and then uh, you introduce a cannula to help uh, to help the positioning of the of the biomaterial and load the cells onto onto the material, and then you size it according to the size of the lesion you have to to cover, and. Uh, um, through this cannula, you can shift the, the membrane directly onto the, onto the lesion, and then um, you can embed the, the, uh, the membrane into the lesion and cover it uh, with, uh, with the platelet gel, which is a little bit sticky and so provide also some, uh, some stability to the, to the implant. And, uh, here it is, you see arthroscopically that uh, the membrane is, is stable and, uh, and, is not, uh, and is not moving. Okay, so back again to the, to the presentation and uh, okay. Uh, well, um, for this series, uh, the patient increased much because we were able to increase the indication to uh, 350 patients, uh, again, 30 years of age, uh, more or less 10.5 years, and the lesion was from 2 centimeter 0.24 to 1.23, so still big lesion, but uh, uh, not that big, not only that big as, uh, as before. And uh, uh, also we went through uh, seeing the activity of the, of the patient we, uh, we treated. Many of them were um, also professional, professional players. 
and uh, um, we need to pay attention to the confounding factor. It's very important when you go to um, through a um, uh, repair of the cartilage that you check the uh, ligamentous laxity and if there is a laxity you repair it and otherwise also it's important to check the state of arthritis so if there is a slight arthritis or an anterior impingement just remove it and again if the arthritis is more you can still try to uh, work with uh, a cartilage regeneration, but it's important that the ankle has a good alignment. And so in many cases, we also performed a uh, reconstruction of the joint, uh, uh, improving the alignment of the joint itself. Uh, so here you can see we had to um, lengthen the fibula in order to uh, reset the, the alignment of the joint itself. And now this is uh, the two years follow up of this of this reconstructed case. Otherwise, if there is a supramalleolar, if there is a supramalleolar alignment, so no inside the joint, but so uh, but um, upstairs the the joint itself. So uh, the um, realignment should be carried out with uh, a supramalleolar osteotomy. And then uh, with all the case series, we see the alpha score passed from 58.8 score, uh, 0.8 points to uh, 86.9 at 72 months. There is, yes, a slight decrease of the, of the scoring from 24 months to 72, but it's, it's something that since the case series is extremely um, is extremely wide and with uh, also case with, with arthritis. So it was, it was quite, it's quite expected as light, as light decrease over time. And is that the patient were able um, to go back uh, to uh, a previous sport practice. So um, the results for this case series, the younger patient, the best result, and this was expected of course. Uh, the previous surgeries instead had a negative impact on the, on the cartilage repair procedure and 54% uh, um, of the patients decided to practice a lower impact, uh, a lower impact activity. Um, still, 33% uh, were able to resume the previous level and among them the three professional players we had in this, in this series. Um, well, uh, an interesting point is that uh, uh, also deeper lesions with bone graft were able to uh, return to sport as previous level uh, also in this case. And uh, um, the interior bone impingement is that had a negative impact on the alpha score. And uh, um, of course, this was expected also because it is an arthritis sign that uh, um, that has impact also on the preoperative on the preoperative scoring. Uh, in fact, the point of the degenerative um, features uh, when you go uh, into a cartilage repair is something that really we should uh, we should uh, study more. And and we are actually doing because uh, um, we are carrying out. Uh, a study about that, uh, uh, trying to see uh, if uh, uh, the arthritis permits still to have uh, um, some kind of benefit from this procedure. Actually, this was uh, uh, the first group of patients with arthritis we treated, so 51 patients with arthritis from one to three, according to Van, D to Van Dyck, and uh, uh, all these patients underwent uh, bone marrow derived cells transplantation and the breathment of the, of the ankle. And uh, um, we divided these patients into groups according to the grade of arthritis. And uh, um, we've seen that uh, the results are influenced by, uh, of course, the grade of arthritis, but also associated procedure, the BMI and the theology. Patients who had a fracture had a worse, a worse outcome. And
method we use, so the bone marrow derived cells, transplantation and ankle debridement and reconstruction in some cases was, was effective since 40% uh, of the patient did not show uh, space narrowing further. And uh, there was also some improvement on the, on the MRI. So uh, another point that should uh, be investigated more is the role of cells. This is something that is uh, uh, very difficult to understand because uh, um, it's also very difficult to count the cells uh, we have. But uh, actually, patients with a buzzer number of cells in the bone marrow aspirate correlate apparently with the uh, outcome at 36 months. So patients with more cells are, uh, have the possibility to gain higher scores, while patients with the higher cell in the bone marrow concentrate correlate with the outcome at 60 months. So it's something that, uh, uh, it's a tendency. So it's something that uh, uh, make us uh, to think that there may be good years and bad healers, but still we are quite uh, far from uh, um, some uh, sure decision about this point. And what about the protocols of rehab? I, I, I'm quite uh, a strong... Uh, go through the literature and see what is uh, the, um, the literature about the rehabilitation after cartilage repair in the ankle, you find the desert. And uh, basically, you should consider that the outcome in the knee uh, is uh, related to a muscle performance. And uh, uh, instead, in the ankle, there is a lower importance of the muscle strength, but there is a major impact of proprioceptions and uh, a range of motion. So the goal was to try to develop a, a two-stage protocol capable to safely help cartilage regeneration, take care of the proprioception, and return as fast as possible to sport. So it's important that patients who had a cartilage repair procedure stay non-way bearing for six weeks. And then I like to advise PAMP for eight weeks, cyclet, pool and gym, full way bearing just only from the eighth week and then recovery to normal training and balancing. Then when we go to a second stage, uh, we need uh, to activate like a traffic-like protocol. So we need to follow um, strictly the patient and see uh, at 16 weeks uh, if there is a normal gait and proprioception. So if yes, go to light running. And uh, if no, uh, back to cyclet and stay a little bit more quiet. And then if going to light running, uh, we should see if there is pain or swelling, if no, then progress to a directional changing and uh, single lack of testing and go back to sports. Otherwise, if yes, again, a more gradual protocol. Uh, specific train for sports uh, is advised at eight months. Uh, the bigger lesion again, so this chronic light type three, when uh, like a half, uh, Talar dome is, uh, is damaged. Uh, well, uh, why an allograft? Uh, the allograft is something that uh, uh, permits to implant a complete organ constituted by bone and cartilage viable, capable to substitute a joint damage or, uh, well, or at least a half of it. Uh, the advantages are, of course, that there is, uh, this is a fresh tissue you can implant and uh, uh, this tissue can integrate uh, in, the, in the joint with improved healing potential. But uh, mm, of course, there are big disadvantages because it's, it's uh, difficult to find, it's difficult to match, it's expensive. It's, uh, maybe there is an immune reaction that uh, we are still investigating. And uh, uh, what about the chondrocyte survival and uh, the uh, post-op, because it's a very long recovery. Uh, we went uh, uh, to uh, both partial and the total allograft. The partial allograft is, uh, is a procedure quite safe. The bipolar instead, the total allograft, it's, it's very controversial. It's, it's a very tricky procedure. 
Uh, well, uh, for the osteochondral allograft also the plug, uh, um, well, uh, we um, discussed also uh, in a consensus of the ICRA AFAS in Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, my personal education is only after failure or a genital procedure. So um, it's something that I do only as a second, a second chance. Uh, or in a very deep, large lesion of the, of the talar dome, or uh, in the lesion with the, uh, with the compromised talar shoulder. And again, uh, in this case, uh, this is a great tree arthritis. And so in this case, it is, um, there is indication for a total, a total bipolar allograft. Uh, of course, uh, you have to uh, go through the contraindications, so no serious joint deformity, no significant osteoporosis, osteonecrosis, uh, vascular pathology infection, and severe ligamentous instability. And uh, uh, the state of the art, uh, if we go through it, there are many, uh, many studies over time that worked uh, on that, uh, from uh, Bill Bagby, from uh, Liu Shon and Mihan. Uh, they had uh, quite a large series of that. And uh, um, again, the partial allografts uh, are. Uh, a uh, very good, uh, a very good option. It's uh, it's appropriate to use uh, this uh, osteochondral allograft uh, to repair uh, a partial talar dome, and we see also here uh, that you can pretty easily use an open uh, access from the anterior side of the of the ankle to substitute a uh, damaged a uh, partial damaged joint. Uh, instead, this is uh, the bipolar, the bipolar allograft. When um, we started from the first 32 cases, so we went through uh, a, a lateral approach. We designed the instrumentation with the uh, um, curved shape. This curved shape helped the positioning of the of the allograft uh, within uh, within the joint uh, and gave uh, a large uh, cancellous bone surface for for the consolidation. We published the result of that in many in many journals, and. Uh, um, here it is uh, a large group of uh, cases we we studied and then we shifted to another kind of technique from anterior so you here we see the lateral shape this is the postoperative of uh, 46 year men and again 46 year old man 32 months follow up and this is instead the anterior approach the anterior approach is more simple is easier um, it's a, a little bit more tricky for the alignment but definitely is is, is easier to position the graft and uh, you don't need a malleolar osteotomy for that. Uh, unfortunately, it's a, a little bit less stable, the tibial component. And again, here you see uh, a, a female which, um, which was, uh, uh, who had um, a previous uh, ankle arthrodesis wow. and uh, the uh, allograft, and again, another pre-op, a male and the allograft, and again, the follow-up of this graft. And again, the follow-up of this graft at 16 months. Uh, also another case, a female with a very bad um, distal tibial fracture, the allograft positioned, and the result at 18 months follow-up. Another again, 20 or 28 years old, and the allograft inside the result at one year follow up. So you see the allograft is very nicely integrated, and this is at seven years of so the MRI. Of course, there is a recurrence of the arthritis over time. That is something that 
uh, should be should be investigated and we are trying to do it it's a, it's a very difficult surgery it's a, mm, a non forgiving surgery so if there is a malpositioning of the graft uh, it will fail if there is uh, a too early way bearing it will fail again and uh, uh, it's true that the scoring it's uh, it's quite good over time but uh, um, even if the scoring is quite good over time, it's something that's very demanding also for the patient because it needs a six month non-weight bearing. Uh, wow. In fact, uh, when we go through our series, we see that we had uh, a very high rate uh, of survivorship of the transplanted chondrocytes. So we didn't notice the uh, early failure with respect to literature, but it's true that we kept the patient uh, non way bearing for around six months. So it's something that's very, very demanding for the patients. It's interesting the work we did on the genetic typing. We've seen that uh, somehow the, the graft uh, it's uh, mm, recolonized, but the DNA of the, of the receiver, and this was not expected. It, uh, it was expected that the DNA and the chondrocyte uh, were to be always the chondrocytes of the of the donor. Instead, is that is not like that. Um, and the, here you can see that the, uh, there is a biopsy at 60 months. 95 percent of the chondrocytes were still still viable. Um, but the burning question uh, are still on. So if there is any influence of the immunological response, I think yes. Uh, how to avoid this uh, arthritis recurrence, we, we don't know. Uh, what's the role of the soft tissue and what's the role of the joint biomechanics? That's for sure, that's for sure a role. So is there any idea to improve? And uh, um, actually, it's uh, now sure that there is some kind of aggression of the, of the uh, immunological system, even uh, against the cartilage that was considered an immunoprivileged tissue, but this is not completely like that. Uh, for the reason we try to go through a very light uh, immunosuppressive therapy, um, but uh, this immunosuppressive therapy had an effect uh, just on the biology. So the, the patient treated showed more cellularity in the superficial layer, higher proteoglycans. And uh, um, also, yes, there was a less caspases 3 marker, uh, which is a marker showing a uh, degenerative process. But uh, uh, when we go uh, to see the X-rays, uh, they were still uh, uh, they were still uh, quite uh, uh, quite bad. So arthritis was was evident, and so there was no correlation. In that uh, the only thing that really showed uh, a strong uh, a strong impact on the arthritis was the good tibial alignment so when the alignment is uh, uh, extremely good the arthritis is less um, well so what what we were gonna do were more attention toward the removal of the allogenic marrow elements so some kind of irrigation caused the um, maybe also uh, an animal study aiming to understand the specific role of preview arthritis environment and the immunological response, but this work is still, is still ongoing. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. That's my experience on the cartilage repair. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a honor to be, to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Francisa. Fantastic presentation and very happy to see the great work that you're doing at uh, Rizzoli Institute. Thank you. Yeah, a few questions. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a level one randomized control trial to compare bone marrow aspirate with the available uh, technology like ACI or MASI? Level I, uh, level one, no. So uh, we are trying now to work, uh, and uh, this is our uh, next task is starting now. Uh, it's, it's a non-blinded study, of course, but it's a comparative uh, of the injection, just injection of the bone marrow 
uh, and hyaluronic acid into, into arthritis. So uh, we are trying to study that, but of course it is not possible to do it blinded because one group has a surgical procedure for the, for the cellar vesting and the other has not, so it wouldn't be ethical. And uh, I feel that it's better to have uh, an unblinded randomized study. Okay. The other one is, uh, what, what do you think about uh, Massey ACI with respect to uh, bone marrow? How do you rate them? Actually, I think that Massey was better. And um, but it's difficult to say it because uh, uh, over time um, we used Messi for very big lesion. And then when we had the, the cells, uh, we extended the practice. So we went from very small to very, very big and also to arthritis. So I never did Messi in arthritis and uh, I never, um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, you see that the cells uh, uh, are something cheaper and you use it also in cases with very less hope. So I'm not sure my case series are completely, uh, are completely easy to, to confront. So it's, uh, but my feeling is that Messi was better, but it's, it's, it's a feeling, it's a non-scientific non -scientific impression. And uh, is an osteochondral autographed possible for the ankle? Autograph is, is possible. So, so how do you, from the knee, you harvest it? Yes, from the knee, of course, is possible. The problem is that uh, it depends, since uh, you have uh, a limited donor source, uh, you uh, need to, um, to use uh, small plaques and the small plaques, uh, I, uh, you know, I prefer to, uh, if you have a small hole, uh, I prefer to, to work with a regenerative procedure, but it works very nice, very nicely. You have to throw down a malleolus, uh, it's a more invasive procedure. It's uh, something that uh, uh, actually, when I go for that, uh, I go for that in failures, I go for that in big holes, uh, and I usually use an allograft. And uh... Do you use Massey in your hospital? Massey in your hospital? No, we stopped. We stopped for uh, for an economical problems. So the Massey, uh, well, we stopped more than ten years ago now. So okay. we we've been using for a long time, but now now only only regenerative procedure. I don't know the future, but uh, the economical situation is not uh, is not brilliant. So I'm not sure that we will go back to Massey again. Are you using it? No, no, no. In India, we have very few centers. I mean, Massey is not popular at all, but there are centers that uh, use ACI. ACI, so you're using it? No, no, not in my place. There are centers. I don't do uh, sports ankle. Uh -huh. I, I do the knee. So there are centers in India who, which do the ACI. Oh, okay. So it's good. Somebody. But Massey, Massey is not available. Oh, I see. Well, so also ACI is something that's, uh, that was very good with the periosteal flap, so good, I see. Yeah, and uh, I think there are no more questions, Francis, a uh, fantastic presentation, and thank, uh, you. thank you for the brilliant work, and uh, I, I mean, I know you for the last 10 years, and only it's now that we got an opportunity to have a presentation with you online. It's a pleasure, thank you. I hope, hope to see you in some meeting very soon. I hope so. Uh, if, uh, if the Last time I think we met at Barcelona, right? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. Well, uh, the next year there will be an unbelievable quantity of meetings, and so I, I don't know if there will be possible to do them and to do them all. So, but uh, hopefully something. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Francisa, and uh, we look forward to one more lecture from your side. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.